Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here um, talking about Jesus on 4th of July, which somehow seems right, doesn't it? Seems Jesus kind of the national icon of America, the mascot of America. If we had a mascot, I think Jesus would probably be our mascot. Um, I'm going to keep my comments fairly brief because I've discovered uh, after you know a couple of years now of traveling the world with this book that uh, when it comes to Jesus, people have a lot to say. Who knew? Um, people are apparently interested in Jesus. Um, and so uh, I'm going to just basically give some opening thoughts, and then we'll open this up for a conversation. I'll tell you a little bit about my, me. I was born in Iran. Um, I sometimes like to joke that I come from a long line of lukewarm Muslims and exuberant atheists. Uh, in, in my family, my mother was the lukewarm Muslim and my father the exuberant atheist. Um, you know, the, the kind of atheist who always had a pocket full of Prophet Muhammad jokes that he would pull out at inappropriate times, you know, like that kind of atheist. Um, my father's atheism actually uh, served us pretty well in 1979 when the Iranian Revolution happened. And Ayatollah Khomeini returned to the country and I don't know if you remember, but he said that he had no interest in any kind of political role. He just wanted to be left alone and go back to his studies and back to his mosque. And my dad, who never trusted anything anyone wearing a turban ever said, uh, heard that and said bullshit and thought that it might be a good idea for us to leave the country for a little while until things settled down. I was... 36 years ago, obviously, things did not settle down. My dad was right about Khomeini, which he reminded me of on a daily basis. Um, we settled in the Bay Area of California, in the San Francisco Bay Area. This was the 1980s. Not sure if you remember the 1980s. It wasn't exactly the best time in the world to be Iranian in the United States, um, as opposed to now, when it's fantastic. Um, <laughs> This was uh, at the height of the Iran hostage crisis, 444 days in which Americans were being held hostage in the embassy in Tehran. And for a seven-year-old kid trying his hardest to fit in and not be weird, it was very important for me to distance myself as much as possible from my heritage, from my culture, certainly from my religion. Uh, in fact, I've admitted on a numerous occasions that I spent a good part of the 1980s pretending to be Mexican. Um, <clears throat> yeah, which by the way tells you how little I understood America because it did not help at all. Turns out we don't like Mexicans that much either. Um, but you know, I always had this fascination with religion, which is I know a weird thing for a seven-year-old to say. Um, I've always been deeply interested in religion and spirituality, religious history, religious phenomenology. I didn't come from a religious family, as I said. I mean, we were culturally Muslim the way that so many people are culturally religious, but it wasn't really a very big part of my life or my upbringing. I think if I were to say why it was the case, it's probably because the, those childhood images of revolutionary Iran and the power that religion has to transform a society for good and for bad really seared itself in my consciousness and created this abiding interest in religion and, and spirituality. But as I say, I didn't really have that much of an opportunity to really do anything about it, to really um, have any kind of spiritual edification. Uh, that is until I went to high school. When I was in high school, uh, when I was about 15, 16 years old, I went with some friends to an evangelical youth camp in Northern California. And it was there that I heard the gospel story for the very first time, this incredible story about the God of heaven and earth coming down in the form of a child, of dying for our sins, the, the promise that anyone who believes in him would also never die but have eternal life. I had never heard anything like this before in my life. It was a transformative moment for me. I immediately converted to this particularly conservative brand of evangelical fundamentalist Christianity, uh, and then began preaching that gospel uh, to anyone, whether they wanted to hear it or not, frankly. Um, I, was, I was, I think, what is like officially referred to as a Bible thumper. I thumped Bibles uh, for, um, for most of high school. Um, and then when I went to university, I went to a Jesuit university, um, Santa Clara University in the Bay Area, uh, 
I decided that this is what I was going to do for a living. I was going to study religion and more specifically study the New Testament, uh, that this is where my passion uh, lay. And it didn't take long in my studies to be confronted with this kind of uncomfortable fact that almost everything that I thought I knew about Jesus was incomplete, if not just incorrect, that there was this chasm between the Jesus of history, as I was learning about him in university, and the Christ of faith, as I was uh, as I knew of him in um, church. Do this here and see if this works. Great. Okay. Sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. We'll see. Now, when I talk to people about this divide, about the difference between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith, I get a lot of confused stares because, well, frankly, for billions of people around the world, Christian and non-Christian, the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith are the same person. You know, this guy. You know this guy. You've seen this guy. Uh, blonde, blue-eyed. <laughs> Probably speaks with a British accent. Which is, you know. I've seen, yeah, he's American, exactly. I, I, I've, I've seen enough movies to know that like all gods, angels, and Nazis speak with British accents. I don't know what that's about. Um, I sometimes, by the way, just, I sometimes like to joke that I call this Megyn Kelly's Jesus. Um, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, uh, Megyn Kelly, of course, is the wildly popular Fox News personality who uh, last Christmas caused a little bit of a controversy uh, when she said on her show that, quote, it is a historical fact that Santa Claus and Jesus Christ were white. I don't, don't know what to say about that, but okay. I actually, uh, <laughs> the truth is, I actually came to Megyn Kelly's defense uh, when she said that in print and on TV, and not just because every time Fox News mentions Jesus, I, I sell books, but <laughs> because she's actually right. Megyn Kelly is right. Her Christ is white because Megyn Kelly is white. Now, if Megyn Kelly were, say, Kenyan, her Christ would be Kenyan. If Megyn Kelly were Ethiopian, her Jesus would be Ethiopian. In fact, the entire gospel story would be understood exclusively through an Ethiopian cultural lens. If Megyn Kelly were, say, Japanese, her Jesus would be Japanese. If she were Chinese, her Jesus would be Chinese. You see, that's the difference between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. The Christ of faith is infinitely malleable. He can be and always has been whatever a worshiper needs him to be. He can take on any race. He can take on any history. Whatever your history is, your Christ will adopt that history. He can take on your politics. This, of course, is the Jesus of Latin America, the Jesus of liberation theology. And while I understand that for a lot of people, certainly the faithful, the notion of a Jesus packing heat uh, might be somewhat disconcerting, somewhat incongruous, perhaps even unhistorical, but I would just remind you that the image of Jesus as a warrior with a bloody sword with which he strikes down the enemies of God goes all the way back to the very beginning. It goes all the way back to the scriptures themselves. And I would argue further that this image is perhaps, while uncomfortable for many people, a little bit more historically relevant than the traditional image of Jesus that we find of him as king, certainly as the European king, uh, the image of Jesus that dons so many churches around this country and around the world. Back to what I was saying. The Christ of faith is infinitely malleable. He can take on your race, your ethnicity, your culture, your heritage, your history, your politics. He can even take on your religion. This is Jesus in Korea. That look familiar to you guys? This is the Buddha crucified. This is the Jesus of the Christian community in Korea. 
This is Jesus in India. He has taken on the iconography of Krishna. He has become Krishna. This is Jesus in Thailand, who has become actually part of the entire uh, pantheon of Thai gods. He is at the center of it. The Christ of faith is infinitely malleable. He can be whatever you need him to be. He can take on any identity that you need of him. The Jesus of history, however, is frozen in place. And while it is enormously difficult to get to that person, to dig through the layer upon layer of interpretation and tradition, of myth and legend, of theology and creed, to actually get to that first century Jew, it is not impossible. It's actually not an impossible task. Because while we know very little about the historical Jesus, and we know very, very little about him, take away the Gospels, take away the Christian writings, and we know almost nothing about this man who was so pivotal in the history of the Western civilization. In fact, I would say that we probably know, I'd say maybe three things with some measure of confidence about the historical Jesus. Minus, of course, the Christian writings, which, as we'll talk about in our conversations, are not really historical documents. They're creedal formulas. They're documents of faith. They're testimonies of faith, not historical biographies. We know probably three things about this man, this historical Jesus of Nazareth. Number one, well, that he was a Jew, which sounds obvious, but it's actually kind of an important thing to bring up, something we tend to forget every once in a while. In fact, I would say that the most important differentiation between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith is that the Christ of faith is a kind of celestial spirit who founds a brand new religion, whereas the Jesus of history is a Jew preaching Judaism to other Jews. That is the most important lens through which to understand the historical Jesus. I'll say it again, the Jesus of history is a Jew preaching Judaism to other Jews. That's how you interpret him. Number one, that he was a Jew. Number two, that sometime in the first half of the first century, he launched a popular apocalyptic movement, a messianic movement, one of dozens of movements uh, in his time. In fact, if you read my book, you'll note that one thing that's quite fascinating about Jesus is he was probably the least well-known and least popular and probably even the least successful of these messiahs of his time. But nevertheless, he launched this movement predicated on something that Jesus referred to as the kingdom of God. Now, what he meant by the kingdom of God 2,000 years of argument about that, but there is no argument that the core and kernel of Jesus's message, the entire purpose of his ministry was to talk about this notion that it seems he himself did not create. It, it's actually very clear that he adopted this idea from John the Baptist, his mentor John the Baptist, but it was a very new notion in his time this concept of the kingdom of God. That was the core and kernel of his preaching. And then what it meant, we can have a conversation about. So number one, he was a Jew. Number two, he started this Jewish movement predicated on the kingdom of God. And number three, as a result of that movement, he was arrested uh, for the crime of sedition by Rome and ultimately crucified, executed. That's it. That is the sum and total of anything that we can say with any confidence about the Jesus of history. So then, how do we fill in the rest of this story? How do we find out the rest of this biography of this man uh, who is so steeped in shadow, so steeped in interpretation? Well, you do it in the way that, that most historians uh, deal with any of these kind of uh, legendary figures in the ancient past. You steep him fully in his time and place, and then you allow his time and place to define him. Now, in Jesus' case, we're really lucky 
Because while, as I said, we know very, very little about the historical Jesus himself, we know almost everything about the world in which he lived. First century Palestine is an era that has been exhaustively documented. By the way, not least because of the Romans, the Romans who occupied this region. Listen, whatever else you want to say about the Romans, they were good at documentation, they were very good at documentation. It was, a very, it was a skill of theirs. Documentation and killing, those were the two sort of, and roads, we'll give them roads. <laughs> documentation, killing, and roads, those were the, the pillars of the Roman Empire. We know how much a bushel of wheat cost in Jesus' time. We have an enormous amount of information about the religious, political, economic, social, cultural milieu out of which Jesus arose. And so it's a very simple proposition. You take what little you know about Jesus, you put him in this world that we know almost everything about, and you let that world define him. What does that mean? Well, it means, first of all, you have to understand that Jesus was speaking to a very specific audience, that he was addressing very specific social ills, that he was in confrontation with very specific religious and political leaders. And so if you want to know what Jesus actually meant when he said something, you need to know who he was talking to, who he was talking about. In our case, of course, we're talking about three major sort of poles of power in his time. First and foremost was the temple authorities. This is the high priest uh, of Israel. The temple, you have to understand, was the heart of the Jewish uh, people. It wasn't just the living dwelling place of the Spirit of God. Literally, the living dwelling place. Okay, I want to make sure that you understand that the Spirit of God, as far as the Jews of Jesus' time were concerned, existed everywhere, but it had a single source, and that was the Holy of Holies inside the temple. There was no other place in which God could be communed with except for this temple. And so if you controlled the temple, you controlled the religion. You decided who could and could not access that spirit of God. You decided what the religion actually meant, what God wanted for the people. And in this case, the temple was not just the sort of center of the Jewish faith. It was also the heart of the Jewish nation. It was the repository for the laws, for um, the documents that, uh, that, the, that the Jews used to define themselves as a people. It was also the largest bank. Um, so it was the, the center of commerce, the center of politics, the, the center of religion. It, it really was everything uh, about the Jewish people of Jesus' time existed inside this temple, which gave the high priest an enormous amount of power. In Jesus' time, of course, the high priest was a man by the name of Caiaphas. The high priest used that power to extract an enormous amount of wealth from the Jews and to hoard that wealth on his own. He was probably the richest Jew in the entire Holy Land at that time. And he maintained control of his authority by completely marrying himself to the Roman occupation. In fact, Rome really treated the high priest like a kind of employee, uh, in a sense, Rome wouldn't decide who would become the high priest. The Sanhedrin decided that. But if Rome was ever displeased with the high priest, and it often was, it would just simply remove the high priest and replace him with somebody else. When the high priest was finished with whatever ceremonies, be it Passover or Tabernacle or whatever the case may be, Rome would actually seize the high priest's holy vestments and the tools that he would use to commune with God and hold on to those and then hand them back out again uh, for the next festival or feast day. And by the way, if there was any confusion about who actually controlled the temple and the high priest, all you had to do was just look at the uh, facility itself, the temple mount itself. On the northwest corner of the temple mount, it literally attached to the temple was the Antonia Fortress, which is where the Roman governor, in Jesus' time, of course, Pontius Pilate, actually resided. And so the temple crawled with Roman soldiers. And so for many, many Jews, particularly poor, pious Jews like Jesus, there really was no difference 
between the Roman governor and the high priest, the Roman occupation and the temple. For them, the temple had become completely corrupted. It was an abomination as a result of not just the corruption and the ineptitude of the high priest and the priestly aristocracy, which passed this uh, title amongst themselves like it was a legacy, but also because they had so fully absorbed the Roman occupation, creating a situation that was intolerable for the vast majority of Jews in Jesus' time. Besides the high priest, of course, there was what was referred to at the time as the Herodian elite. This is the great Herod the Great, uh, the king of the Jews, who died in the very year that Jesus was born, 4 B.C. Yes, Jesus was born before Christ. I know, it's, con it's confusing. 4 B.C. is Jesus' is, is birth date. Herod's revolution in uh, the Holy Land created a new class of Jews, they were referred to as Hellenistic or the Herodian elite. These were Jews that had married themselves again to the Roman occupation and had managed to amass an enormous amount of wealth, creating an unbelievable gap between the very, very rich and basically everyone else who was very, very poor. They would use this money to buy up land from uh, farmers and then employ those very same previous landowners as essentially slave labor on the land that they used to own. The Herodian elite had essentially also absorbed these sort of Greek, Roman, Hellenistic ideals. Um, they had, in the minds of many Jews, essentially abandoned Judaism altogether. In fact, they began to stop uh, actually circumcising themselves. So really, the sort of the pivotal connection between the, the Jewish people and their past, the, 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 their father Abraham, they had cut themselves off of, no pun intended. That truly was no pun intended. <laughs> truly, truly, in that sense. Um, again, an enormous amount of wealth. And by the way, this was at a time in which currency, physical currency, was just then adopted in uh, first century Palestine. This notion of going from bartering and trade to actually coins stamped with the face of you know, the emperor uh, that, that became sort of the, a symbol for what something was worth had profound implications on the Jews of Jesus' time, on what it meant to actually be wealthy. It wasn't about how much land you owned or how much sheep you owned. It was about how much coin you owned. And if you could just amass enough of that coin, then you can swallow up everyone else's land and sheep. And so you can understand how the uh, sudden introduction of currency like this absolutely upended the traditional economy of this place and created, as I say, this enormous gap. And then finally, of course, was Rome itself. In the time of Jesus, of course, the emperor was uh, Octavian, also known as Caesar Augustus. And it, again, it's very important to understand that the Roman occupation was utterly complete in Jesus' time. Rome controlled every aspect of life for the Jews. The religion, as I say, because of their control of the temple. The economy, because of the uh, relationship that they had with the Herodian elite. The social uh, aspect of it, the cultural aspect of it. In fact, for the Jews of Jesus' time, it was impossible for, even their very movement was under the control of a Roman occupier, a heathen Roman occupier who lived thousands of kilometers away. This was, as I say, an intolerable situation for the Jews, which is why that Jesus' era was an era that was awash in apocalyptic expectation. One after another, messiahs rose up, preaching liberation from Roman occupation, preaching things like the coming of the kingdom of God, of God's justice coming to earth, and one after another, they were killed for it, for a very simple reason. Messiah in Jesus' time means something very, very specific. It means that you are the descendant of King David, that you are here to reestablish David's kingdom on earth and to usher in the rule of God. That's it. That's what it means. If you stand up in Jesus' time and say, I am the Messiah, you mean you are the descendant of King David, you're here to reestablish David's kingdom, 
course, to reconstitute the 12 tribes of Israel. That's what it means to establish David's kingdom and to usher in the rule of God. Well, if you are claiming to be ushering in the rule of God, you are claiming to be ushering out the rule of Caesar, that's treason. It's as simple as that. Which is why to a person, every Jew who stood up and called himself the Messiah was killed for it. Most of them were killed in the way that Jesus was killed, crucifixion. After all, crucifixion was a punishment that Rome reserved exclusively for crimes against the state. Crimes like treason, sedition, rebellion, insurrection. These are the only crimes for which you could be crucified. Now, people at a certain point will say, yeah, but wasn't Jesus crucified alongside two thieves? No, he was not. The Greek word that the Gospels use to describe the two men who were crucified on either side of Jesus, lest I, does not mean thieves. It can mean thieves, but it doesn't. Klepti means thieves, lest I means bandits. And in Jesus' time, bandit was the most common term for an insurrectionist, for a rebel. Jesus himself was called a bandit, a lestis, on a number of occasions in the Gospels. In fact, it's quite clear what Jesus was crucified for. Every human being, every person who was crucified was given what was called a titulus, a giant sign that was either put at their feet or at their head, declaring the crime for which they were being crucified. Jesus' crime was there for all to see. King of the Jews, striving for kingly duty, which, by the way, is synonymous with claiming to be the Messiah. You have to understand that crucifixion, as weird as this sounds, was not even a form of capital punishment in Roman times. In fact, it was often the case that Rome would kill you first and then crucify you. The purpose of crucifixion was not to kill the criminal. The purpose of crucifixion was to act as a deterrent against any kind of rebellion or insurrection, which is why it was such a grotesque form of punishment and a public form of punishment. Crucifixions were always done in public squares, at, on, on, on top of hills, uh, at the entryway to major cities. For instance, like Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified, which was a hill right at the entrance to the main, the main gates of Jerusalem. So understand this, you could not walk into the city of Jerusalem without first passing by hundreds of dead or dying Jews, all of them put on a cross for daring to defy the will of Rome. It's about as clear a message as it gets. And so, when you look at the historical Jesus, when you look at the Christ of faith on that cross, that pivotal icon of Christianity, what you see is an innocent man dying for the sins of humanity. But when you look at the Jesus of history on that cross, what you actually see is one bandit being crucified alongside two other bandits, all of whom were given the same punishment for the crime of defying the will of Rome. Now, <clears throat> instead of going through and talking about what all of this means for an understanding of who Jesus was, that's what I want the last 30 minutes of our conversation to be about. I just want to sort of stop for a moment and say something that's kind of important because, you know, sometimes when I talk about this difference between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith, I get particularly faithful people in the audience who... who will sometimes criticize me because they'll say that I'm sort of, I'm taking away anything that's extraordinary about Jesus, right? I'm, I'm treating him like he's just a human being, that I'm, I'm making him normal, that he's no longer special when I talk about him in this way. I get criticized for a lot of things, and a lot of those are perfectly valid criticisms. This one I don't get at all, because for me, thinking about Jesus as a man, whatever else he may be. He may be God. He may be the Son of God. He may be the Messiah. Those are perfectly fine views about Jesus. But even if you believe he is God incarnate, you also believe that he's a man. And if he's a man, then that means something. It means that you have to look to some of his motivations as human motivations. And so when I think of Jesus as a man, what I see is 
is not somebody who's normal or no longer extraordinary. On the contrary, what I see is a man, a poor, pious, illiterate, uneducated, Jewish peasant from the backwoods of Galilee, what we would nowadays refer to as a country bumpkin, basically, who despite that, despite all of that, through the power of his teachings, through the power of his charisma, was able to start a movement on behalf of the poor and the weak, the dispossessed, the marginalized, women especially, we can have a conversation about what that means, about the role of women in Jesus' ministry, a movement that was seen as such a threat to the most powerful empire the world had ever known that he was hunted down like a bandit, like a criminal, arrested, tortured, and executed for the crime of sedition. I don't know about you, but that sounds like the most interesting man in the world, okay? I mean, you can call that guy Fred if you want to. If I told you that story about anyone, you would be, you'd want to know more about that person. And so for me, Jesus the man is as compelling, as extraordinary, as worth knowing, in fact, as worth following as Jesus the Christ. And so I don't really see a kind of, I don't know, a lessening of his position in seeing him as a historical figure. You can see him as the Christ of faith. You could see him as malleable if you want to. But freezing him in his time and place doesn't make him less interesting, as far as I'm concerned. In fact, it makes him more interesting. In fact, I can say with total confidence standing here before you that now that I'm no longer a Christian, I am far more a devoted follower of the Jesus of history than I ever was of the Christ of faith, that the lesson, the example that he uh, taught 2,000 years ago about how to confront social injustice, how to confront the, the gatekeepers of salvation and the powers that be is an example that is as resonant today as it was back then. So I'll stop here. I think we've got someone with a mic walking around. We've got lots of time uh, for questions. And I'm happy to talk about any part of the conversation or any issue about uh, Jesus, or if you want to have a much broader conversation about the role of religion in history and how a scholar um, sort of navigates those two, I'm happy to have that conversation too. I just have one sort of rule about these things, and it's not please ask a question and don't make a statement. I actually like statements. I think sometimes statements are even more interesting than questions. It's that I always go male, female, male, female. I go back and forth. So if a gentleman asks a question, you know, we'll just wait here all day until a lady asks a question as well. So let's start with the lady back there. Hi, first of all, thank you for this. Um, but my question is, if the Christ of faith is infinitely malleable, as you, as you said, can he be a woman? And if not, why not? Mm, that's a very, very good question. Well, there is an enormous corpus of material written not just by contemporary scholars, but stuff that goes back hundreds of years about the feminine nature of Christ. Uh, and if you do a, just a research on sort of Christ as feminine, you'll get, you'll get an, a, a lot of that material. But that material is predicated not just on the sort of kind of Judaism that he is preaching, which is a very sort of interesting mix between the kind of muscular ethno-nationalistic Judaism that he preaches, right? So when he goes to see the Syrophoenician women, the, the, really the only non-Jew that he ever kind of has a real uh, contact with uh, in the Synoptic Gospels, uh, this, you, I know some of you might remember this story, like he goes to draw some well and there's a Syrophoenician woman there and he asks for some water and she says, you know, uh, we're, we're, uh, he sort of, it sort of it announces himself as the Messiah to her and she says, come to my village and preach and Jesus very famously says, uh, it's not fit to give the food meant for the children to the dogs, meaning the children are Israel and the dogs are the Gentiles. And the woman says quite famously, well, but can the, the dogs can eat the crumbs that fall from the table. And Jesus says, you're right. Go, your faith has healed you. But he doesn't go with her. In fact, Jesus never 
ever sets foot in a Gentile city. He never preaches to a Gentile community. Why? Because he's a Jew preaching Judaism to other Jews. So there's a muscular ethno-nationalistic element to it. But then it's sort of softened with this conception of the kingdom of God that is, to put it in somewhat crude terms, very feminine in its approach, right? That is all inclusive, that even has a role for Gentiles at the end of time, not, not during Jesus' preaching. His conception of the kingdom of God is for Jews, but he quite uh, openly uh, keeps uh, open the possibility that non-Jews can join this movement uh, at the end of time, that there is a space for them, as he, as he kind of uh, puts it in his final preaching to, to the disciples before he's uh, taken, taken up. So that aspect to it has actually led a, a lot of very fascinating conversations uh, about the sort of the feminine nature of Christ. Um, I would suggest, I think probably my favorite writer on this topic is Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza. Um, and so she would be a very good resource for that. Uh, gentlemen? Guess up front. Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, could you talk about uh, Jesus' family life, his parents, his yes. sketchy girlfriends? Um, <laughs> like it's a very, very good question and a, and a really tough one uh, to talk about. Um, what we know about uh, what we can be confident about Jesus is that he uh, is a Nazarean. In fact, it's really the, one of the few things that people could all agree on, that he came from the village of Nazareth. And the reason that's significant is because Nazareth was such a small village that it doesn't actually appear on any maps until the end of the first century, almost the beginning of the second century. This was a village of maybe a hundred families tops, a village of mud and brick homes. As far as we know, the archeological evidence indicates there was not a single road in Nazareth, there was not a single bath in Nazareth, not a single school, not even a synagogue in Nazareth. That's how small this village was. Um, and the reason that we're sort of confident about you know, his, his uh, Nazareth as his birthplace is because Throughout his entire life, Jesus was not called Jesus. Jesus was called the Nazarene. This is interesting because Jesus, or Jesus, of course, is the Greek for Yeshu. Yeshu uh, is the nickname for Yeshua. So Jesus' name was actually Yeshua, uh, but everyone would call him Yeshu as, uh, for short. Yeshua was the most common name for boys in Jesus's time. I mean, if you said, you know, Jesus in a crowd, like 50 people would say, huh? Uh, it was a extremely common name. And so you had to constantly figure out a way to differentiate one Jesus from another. And you could do that either by a father, but interestingly, Jesus is never ever referred to as Ben Yosef, right? He's never referred to as the son of Joseph. At one point in the Gospels, he's referred to as Ben Miriam, which is so bizarre, we don't know what to say about it, okay? He's actually called the son of Mary in the Gospels. That is, well, impossible. It's impossible, okay? It's just, it doesn't happen, uh, which uh, has led to an enormous amount of speculation about Maybe Jesus was the, the, uh, a bastard. Maybe there, you know, uh, Mary had him out of wedlock. Uh, what I, what we, what we do know for certain is that in first century, if someone referred to a a son as Ben Miriam, it was a swear word. It was a derogatory term. It was a way of saying you're a bastard. That's the way to say it. it's a very very weird thing. But he was known as the Nazarene because. The truth of the matter is Nazareth was such a podunk town that it's very rare that there would be, you would be talking about some other Nazarene. You know, no one's going to be like, hey, did you see the Nazarene? Which Nazarene? There's just the one Nazarene. The nobody, nobody else famous is from this town. So we know he's from Nazareth. We know he belongs to a very large family. We know the names of four of his brothers, uh, Simon, Judas, Joseph, uh, and uh, James. James, of course, is the most famous of his brothers. James, Yaakov, 
as he was known, will ultimately uh, not just become one of the most prominent followers of Jesus, but he will actually be uh, Jesus' successor. He will lead the church after Jesus' death uh, and become an enormously influential, prominent man. In fact, again, take away all Christian writings. We know more about James than we know about Jesus. Romans wrote about James. Nobody cared about Jesus. James was a very important man. Want to know how important he was? Jesus led the Jesus movement for three years. His brother James led it, led it for 30 years. Uh, very important. And then he had an untold number of sisters who unfortunately are not named in the Gospels, which is fairly standard in that time. Was he married? This is a very difficult question because it rests on two conflicting facts. The first is that for a 30-year-old Jewish male in the first century to have not been married, he may as well be from Mars. Uh, it, now, that is not to say that there's no such thing as celibacy in Jesus' time. There were celibates, but they were monks. They were monastic orders. Uh, for instance, the Essenes. The Essenes were celibate. But if you were a celibate, then you, you, you belong to one of these orders and you went and lived off in the Judean desert by yourself because you not only rejected marriage and children, you rejected society altogether because those mean the same thing. Jesus obviously did not. There's also a problem in that the Midrash makes it very clear that you are not allowed to be called rabbi unless you have a wife and children. And yet Jesus was called rabbi. By everyone, he was called rabbi. So they must have known something that we don't know. That's what people think. So there's that problem. That's the first fact. But here's the second fact. In everything ever, ever written about Jesus, by his friends and by his followers, by his detractors and by his disciples, everything ever written about Jesus, there is never a mention of a wife and children. Never, ever. And we don't know what to do with that silence. Um, and so we don't have an answer. Logic di dictates he must have had a wife and children. He must have. But the fact that there is not one iota of evidence, not one mention anywhere uh, in anything ever written about him makes it very difficult for us to kind of figure out what's going on there. Uh, let's see, do we have a lady? Yes. Talking to me. There's been some discussion in the Gnostic Gospels that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. Could you comment on that, please? Yes. So not married, not married, but in the Gnostic Gospels. So just to be clear, so we, you know, there are four canonized Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptics uh, because they're essentially the same gospel. Mark is the first gospel. It was written sometime after 70 AD. Jesus was born, as I say, around 4 BC. He died somewhere around between 28 and 32 um, AD. And the first gospel was written, uh, Mark, sometime, sometime between 70 and 73 AD. Um, and then Matthew and Luke's gospels were written 20 years later, around 90 AD. Interestingly, Matthew and Luke were uh, writing at completely different Places They had no knowledge of each other at all, but they both had the Gospel of Mark, and they were both trying to sort of, you know, expand it. The Gospel of Mark, if you read it, is kind of somewhat unsatisfying gospel. There's no infancy narrative. Jesus just shows up on the banks of the River Jordan, and he gets baptized. There's no resurrection in the Gospel of Mark. The women go to the tomb to wash Jesus. The tomb is empty. There's a man there that says, who are you looking for? And they say, we're here for Jesus. And they say, he's not here. Go tell the disciples and Peter. It's a weird thing to say. Go tell the disciples and Peter uh, that he'll meet uh, them in Jerusalem. And then the Gospel of Mark ends with this line. And the women ran away from there, and they told nothing to no one because they were afraid. The end. That is a really weird way to end a gospel. Uh, the first gospel. A, because obviously they told someone, so that's not true. Um, in fact, it's such an unsatisfying way to write a gospel that 200 years later, a monk actually wrote eight more verses to the gospel of Mark. 
Uh, we know that those verses were added later because we have earlier versions of the gospel that does, don't have that line. So as you can understand, this was unsatisfying for a lot of Christians, and so Matthew and Luke decided to fix the situation. And so they took the gospel of Mark, they added infancy narratives, they added resurrection narratives, they sort of added some of their own material in the middle of it, and we called those three the synoptics. And then there's John. John, the last of the four gospels, were written sometime between 100 and 120, at a time in which this is now a, no longer a Jewish movement, it's now Christianity, it is a Roman movement, in fact, it's totally divorced itself from Judaism, the Jews are the enemy in John's gospel. Jesus is not a Jew in John's gospel at all. Uh, he just rails against the Jews constantly. In the synoptics, he rails against the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the priests. In John, it's just the Jews. He just, he, he, he's against the Jews in general. Those are the four uh, canonized Gospels, but they're, of course, not the only Gospels. Uh, about 70 years ago, we knew they existed because we had sort of traditions about them, but about 70 years ago, uh, in a uh, cave in Upper Egypt in a village called Nag Hammadi, uh, we discovered a treasure trove that we now refer to incorrectly as the Gnostic Gospels. Um, and these are all the Gospels that didn't make the cut. And they include the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Philip, the Gospel of the Egyptians, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, a whole host of letters, etc. Gospels that, with the exception of the Gospel of Thomas, were written very late, second, third, fourth centuries, and they represent for us uh, the enormous diversity of belief when it came to early Christianity and who Jesus was. They're not very helpful in discovering the historical Jesus because they were written so late, but they do tell us how wildly eclectic people's views of Jesus uh, was. In a number of those Gospels, uh, talking about the feminine nature of, of Jesus, uh, you, get a, you get this kind of Gnostic quality, uh, this idea of a spirit within that is uh, the real uh, individual and that the body is just a shell that has to be uh, sort of uh, discarded in order to have you know, a communion with God, traditional mysticism. But very famously, in a number of those Gospels, there are these hints about a very special relationship that Jesus has with Mary Magdalene. Uh, in fact, he, uh, in, in, uh, very famously, the disciples, Peter especially, complains about, he says, how come, how come the Lord kisses us on the cheek but kisses Mary on the lips? That's not fair. Um, uh, you know, the, disi the disciples are constantly complaining about how Mary is always with them. Like, why is Mary always here? Why come Mary is following us everywhere? And Jesus very famously says, if I choose to make Mary a man, I will choose to do so. It's a weird thing to say, but it's very Gnostic in, in that notion. We know uh, that Jesus had female disciples. This is very important. Jesus did not have 12 disciples. He had 12 apostles. Apostles are different than disciples. Apostles are essentially 12 disciples that he gave the power to go preach without his uh, supervision. Those are the apostles. Those are the 12 that you're all familiar with. But according to the Gospel of Luke, he had 72 disciples. And among those disciples, because the definition of disciple was someone who traveled with Jesus from village to village. If you traveled with him from village to village, you were a disciple. And most definitely, he had women disciples. In fact, we know their names, which is crazy. We don't even know the names of Jesus' sisters, and we know the names of his disciples. They must have been enormously influential. To have been named in the Gospels is a very big deal if you're a woman, uh, and we know their names. And most prominent among these disciples was Mary of Magdala. Now, the interesting thing about Mary of Magdala is that if I asked you who's Mary Magdalene, almost every one of you would say, yeah, the prostitute, which is weird because she is never, ever called a prostitute in any Gospels. There is no, at no point is Mary Magdalene ever referred to as a prostitute at all. There is this very famous story about a prostitute in the Gospel of John, which is so unhistorical, nobody ever takes it seriously, but that prostitute is not called Mary Magdalene. 
Whereas Mary Magdalene was quite clearly one of the leading disciples of Jesus. And so that caused an enormous amount of consternation in the early church. And so very quickly, Mary Magdalene, the first among the female disciples, became associated with this prostitute that Jesus saved. And so she was so grateful to him that you know she followed him around everywhere like a puppy dog, and Jesus just sort of allowed it to happen. That is not who this woman was. She is in all four Gospels. The, the only individual that all four Gospels agree was the first to see Jesus risen from the dead. She's an enormously complex and very important figure in Christianity, which is why she, her role has been diminished. Whether she was also Jesus' companion or lover, hard to say. She's never called his wife. Uh, but yes, in, in the Gnostic Gospels, there is clearly a much more intimate relationship that they must have had. Uh, a gentleman. I guess up front here, any in the one? I'll let you decide. Oh, hey, thank you. And th thank you very much. Um, so the, the, I, something that runs through my mind, and um, you know, I was recently in, in Israel, in Jerusalem, Jerusalem often, and... Um, Throughout the country, anti-Muslim sentiment is palpable. The Christians, however, seem to get a free pass. Like, and I don't know whether that's simply about because of tourism or whether there's some other thing going on there, but, but something that, that, that puzzles me and feels like a dark space that I just don't understand is evangelical agitation and or support uh, within Israel today um, having something to do with end times and uh, apocalyptic uh, mm -hmm. scriptures. And I wonder, can you help clarify for me what the hell they're doing? Sure, sure. And how that's, the, sure, how, how, sure, where, yeah. where the free pass comes from? Uh, I've written a lot about this, by the way, in my uh, second book, uh, Beyond, which is in paperback, is Beyond Fundamentalism. Uh, first of all, let me say the Christians don't get a free pass in the occupied territories. They do in uh, Israel proper. But in the last decade, there have been 29 cases of arson, vandal vandalism, uh, and outright destruction of Christian churches and monasteries uh, in the occupied territories as a result of what is referred to now as price tag uh, terrorism. Uh, this is uh, a, a group of radical Jewish settlers uh, who believe, of course, that their loyalty is not to the secular state of Israel, but to the biblical land of Israel, who are trying to rebuild uh, the kingdom of David, and to do so, they have to cleanse that land of all non-Jews. Uh, and they've made life absolutely miserable for Palestinian Christians in, in the occupied territories. But you're right, in Israel proper, yes, thanks largely to an enormous amount of money that is coming from Christians around the world, uh, you have a completely different situation there. So I'm going to give you the very, very quick version of this because I do want to get one more question before we run out of time. Okay, so the temple in, in the year 70, in the year 66, the Jews rose up against the Romans, miraculously managed to kick Rome out of Jerusalem, keep them at bay for about four years, mostly because Rome was dealing with its own civil war and to them, the Jews were just a flea on their back that they didn't even worry about until they finished their civil war and then they realized, oh right, the Jews, let's go kill them too. So they showed, they came back, they killed everyone. Uh, nearly a million Jews uh, were slaughtered, if you believe Josephus. They burned the city of Jerusalem and the temple, the actual living, dwelling place of the Spirit of God, literal dwelling place of the Spirit of God to the ground, defiled its ashes. Uh, renamed the city eventually uh, Iola Capitolina. Uh, Josephus says that when they were done, you would never guess there was a city called Jerusalem. Um, and then what Jews remained were exiled out of the Holy Land. This was, of course, an apocalyptic moment. And so this notion started to arise both in Judaism and in Christianity separately, interestingly, on separate tracks, that uh, the, the return of the Messiah or in the case of the Jews, the advent of the Messiah, because they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah, would be predicated on the rebuilding of that temple. That if they can just rebuild the third temple, uh, the Jews say, the Messiah will arrive, 
And Christians say, well, the Messiah already arrived. He'll just come back if we rebuild the temple. The problem, of course, is around the 7th century, J Jerusalem became an Islamic land, and the Dome of the Rock was built uh, atop there, and that Dome of the Rock still exists, and the temple is still under the authority of the Waqf, the uh, Islamic authority um, in Jerusalem. So there is no third temple building unless you destroy the dome first. Um, and so you have this, over the last 50 years, this fascinating collusion between right-wing Christian evangelicals in the U.S. and right-wing Jewish fanatics in Israel who have nothing in common with each other except for this, uh, to bring, tear down that temple, and there's been at least three thwarted attacks uh, against the, the, uh, the Dome of the Rock, one which in 1992, very, very famously, I mean, it was just, it, just a total accident that some janitor discovered bombs that were, that were encircling uh, the Dome of the Rock and alerted the authorities um, to tear that thing down, rebuild the third temple. Now, here's the weird thing about it, is that uh, for Christians who are essentially the money behind it, they're the ones who, who send all the money, uh, and for Jews who are actually doing the work on the ground there, they have this cooperation but theologically, that cooperation is, doesn't work because for, according to Christianity, the first thing that Jesus does when he comes back is get rid of the Jews. Um, now, the Jews obviously don't believe that. They don't really pay any attention to it. Um, and so for them, they're more than happy to take all of this money and to build things like the Temple Institute, etc., which overlooks the Temple Mount today, uh, in order to, uh, you know, essentially get rid of the Muslims and, and rebuild this temple and to uh, consecrate the land uh, for the Messiah. It, so yeah, it's a weird fellowship. It's a weird, weird bedfellows, but it is what it is. Do I have to stop even though we started a little bit late? Or can I get one more question? Okay, one, okay, one, one more question from a woman. Maybe well, that nice lady over there who's been raising her hand like crazy. And then I'll, and then I'll, and then I'll really answer more been. questions um, while I'm signing books. I Thank promise. you for... Um, Appreciating my uh, <laughs> You're very knowingness. enthusiastic yes, about Yes, that yes. too. Um, so I was a religious studies major in college, and um, I think it, one, shocked my parents because they used to have to drag me to confirmation class, mm -hmm. and two, kind of concerned them. But luckily, I have a job, so that's good. They're very happy about yeah, that. Yeah, that's always nice, yeah. Um, and I wanted to know, it was during college that I fell in love with the humanity of Jesus and with the Gospels specifically. Um, and I wanted to know what your favorite story in the Gospel is. Very good, very good. Um, oh, there's, a, there's a lot of these stories that I love, um, but I would have to say the one that kind of stirs me um, Besides, I do love the Syrophoenician story because it's so weird in so many, like it just, I think for a lot of people, it doesn't make any sense at all. The one that I think stirs me the most is the one in which, so Jesus comes back, he's you know, born and raised in Nazareth and then sometime around the year 26, 27 just disappears uh, and goes off to hang out with John the Baptist. Uh, John the Baptist, an enormously influential, very popular, way, way more famous than Jesus in his lifetime uh, preacher. Uh, and Jesus becomes one of his disciples. And then John dies, and then Jesus uh, leaves, and he goes back to Nazareth, but he comes with two other people with him, right? And those two people, Andrew and Philip, are actually John's disciples, so most scholars believe that essentially what happens is that John's movement fragments and Jesus becomes sort of one of the leaders of that movement to continue to preach John's message. And indeed, the first two things, the first thing that Jesus says and the first thing that Jesus does are borrowed from John. The, be, uh, repent, the kingdom of God is here. That's verbatim John's message. And of course, baptism, that's, that's John's invention. He sort of created that very, that very notion. And then most famously, of course, the Lord's Prayer, right? Uh, we all know the Lord's Prayer, uh, but we don't know how the Lord's Prayer begins, which is with a question from the disciples. Oh, oh Master, 
teach us to pray the way John taught you to pray. And then Jesus says, it's like this, our Father who are in heaven, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so it's quite clear that he, he began his ministry as just one of John's disciples. But he comes back to, um, the, uh, to Nazareth, and he, is, he starts to preach, uh, and he gets you know, thrown out of there, so he goes to Capernaum. And in Capernaum, that's where his ministry first begins. And his family is scandalized, absolutely scandalized by the things that Jesus is saying because obviously they're worried, they're afraid that the Romans are going to show up and kill everybody as a result of this. So they decide that they're going to come down, James and, and Mary, his mother, they're going to come down and they're going to put a stop to it, right? And so as Jesus is preaching, um, he, somebody says to him, hey, your mother and your brother and your sisters are here and they want to talk to you. And then you all know what Jesus says, right? Who is my mother? Who is my brother? Who is my sister? And he looks around and he says, these are my mothers. These are my brothers. These are my sisters. Anyone who follows me is my mother, my brother, my sister. And I always love that phrase because you have to understand that at this moment, this is a tiny tiny group. It's a tiny movement. And so it, the way that it sort of Jesus in, sort of envisions it is as a family, right? As a family unit, that this is kind of the core bond of what it means to be, well, they wouldn't have called themselves Christian then, but to be a follower of Jesus. And I think for me, why that's really valuable is in my experience, both as a Christian and having left Christianity, I think the thing that is most beautiful about the faith and the thing that it strives so often and fails to achieve is that sense of family, that idea that in the midst of this global religion of two billion people with an infinite number of sects and schisms and an infinite number of interpretations, uh, that at the core of it is this notion of a single family. It's all about brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers. And I think that if Christianity could get that back, to get that sense back that Jesus first kind of inaugurated 2,000 years ago, uh, it would be a far more, I think, fruitful and successful faith. Thank you, everyone.